Hello and welcome everyone to a community webinar on anti-Semitism. Before we get started, closed captioning is available for this program. You can view the captions by clicking view subtitle at the bottom of your screen. In a report conducted by the University of Chicago and issued by the ADL less than two weeks ago, they found that anti-Semitic or anti-Jewish attitudes are held by approximately 20% of Americans. This was defined by those people who felt that they agreed with at least six anti-Jewish tropes, either mostly or all the time. These findings about attitudes come at a time where we have seen a significant increase in the number of anti-Jewish incidences occurring at the national and local levels. Nationally, we have seen famous political, media, and sports personalities articulate Jew hatred, some repeatedly. These are people who have global followers and can significantly impact attitudes. Locally, we have seen increases in anti-Jewish acts across our community. These have included almost weekly swastikas found in schools, spray painting of hate on the Bethesda Trail, outside of a local high school, near public transportation, and the flyering in communities around the region by organizations seeking to intimidate and scare the Jewish community. As a result, many have been asking, what is going on? How do we understand anti-Jewish hatred in America today? And what can we do about it? To get to these questions and others, I am delighted to be joined by Professor James Leffler. James is a senior fellow of the Kogod Research Center at the Shalom Hartman Institute of North America. He also serves as the director of the Jewish Studies Program and Jay Berkowitz Professor of Jewish History at the University of Virginia. His scholarly research explores the ties between law, culture, and politics in modern Jewish history. He is also currently working on a book about anti-Semitism and civil rights in post-war America. I'd like to thank the people who've already submitted questions for the program. Many of these have been integrated into the discussion. We will also be taking questions from participants towards the end of the session. If you have questions, please submit it at the time by utilizing the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Finally, I would like to thank the Shalom Hartman Institute for the tremendous partnership and James for this important conversation. So Jim, to start us off, I would like you to talk a little bit about the state of anti-Semitism or Jew hatred in America today. I would like us to first talk through the nature and definition of Jew hatred and how they play out in the United States today. Where are we and have we been here before? Sure. Thank you very much, Gil. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you, um, to be hosted uh, at the Federation this evening and to join all of you for this conversation um, about anti-Semitism. I'll just say also, uh, I come to you as a scholar um, and a stakeholder because uh, although I'm here um, through the Shalom Hartman Institute in this partnership, uh, I, as you heard, I teach at the University of Virginia. I live in Washington, DC. I've lived in DC, Maryland, Virginia. I've uh, been affiliated with many synagogues and still am. Uh, so uh, this is an issue that I speak to you about um, as a scholar with research backgrounds, um, but also someone who understands acutely that um, this is uh, a very live presence in many people's lives. So let me start by um, just saying a few words as Gil you invited me to do about um, where we are and have we been here before. Um, there is no question that we uh, are in the midst of a crisis. Uh, what is striking to me is that this is a crisis in which we are still um, uh, trying to make sense of where it comes from and what it is. Uh, I would say in this long stretch of American history, there have been other moments where we faced an upsurge in anti-Semitism. We all know the story about the 1920s and really the 1930s uh, as a time um, when there was great fear and terror among Jewish Americans um, for what might be coming. Uh, and what was happening in terms of the, the churn of uh, extremist politics that was turning Jews into a scapegoat. Um, we have other moments in, in American history where this has happened, even before that moment, uh, in terms of the, the great era of immigration from Eastern Europe. We have a case actually 
And this is very interesting to note in the 1940s, after the World War II, uh, the end of World War II, after the Holocaust, even as Americans decided that they didn't like Hitler and the Nazis, uh, even as they decided that they liked the idea of a Jewish state, they didn't want Jews coming. And anti Semitic attitudes at that point shot up. They continued to be high uh, through much of the mid and later 40s, uh, with numbers that actually parallel some of the numbers you just mentioned to us this evening. Um, and then it went down, uh, and then it came back up. And so there is a cyclical element to anti-Semitism in American society. Uh, and I think any conversation about what we do and how we understand it has to recognize um, it is not that it was never there. Uh, it, it ebbs and flows, and it, it, it surges at different moments. So what makes this moment different? Uh, and I want to just uh, throw out uh, three things, Gil, and then we can talk about them. Uh, from a historian's perspective, um, given I just told you we've had anti-Semitism all along, right, and it's gotten worse and, and gotten better, quote unquote, what is it about this moment that is unique? And I would say, as I said, three things. Uh, the first is the public nature of it. Uh, the second is the politicization. And the third is a kind of sense of paralysis. The three P's. I'm sorry to be cute about it, but you're talking to a professor. Um, so the public part is there is no question that anti-Semitism has been in our in, in our presence and a force in American society. Uh, and it has been present in all parts of the American political spectrum, in different communities, uh, in different institutions. What's clear, uh, what's clearly different now is that it is much more visible. Right, and it's much more visible in the mainstream of our polit political discourses. It's much more visible uh, in many institutions that our children and we pass through. Uh, it's much more visible in our streets. Uh, and that is something new. To give you one sort of uh, extreme example, we've had anti Semitic discourses inside American politics, right? We've had parties try and get purchase on the American electorate through anti Semitism. We've had mainstream politicians who were anti Semitic, but most of those politicians and even presidents, we didn't hear about that publicly, right? I think of the example of Richard Nixon, where we know he had terribly anti-Semitic views. Uh, and one can look uh, in the democratic world and find presidents who fit that mold also. Um, but we didn't hear about that. And those views were not put out in front of the public. So we're in a different way, uh, different situation in how we are confronting it. Uh, because as you mentioned, now leading figures in society will open, openly express it. And um, those attitudes are then amplified and magnified. The second issue, I've already mentioned politics, which we know that we are at a polarized moment in American society and in the Jewish community. Uh, up until recently, there were great debates about anti-Semitism among Jewish Americans, but the debates were not right-left. And I think that's a key factor here, right? That we now view things much more through partisan lenses, and it makes it much harder to do the work, the vital work that you do at the Federation uh, and that community members themselves try and do, which is unify. Um, so the right-left polarization has made the politics of anti-Semitism anti uh, even more potent uh, and harder to confront. And with that, of course, is Israel, Israel-Palestine. That's a big, big challenge. Um, there was always that element to different degrees inside American society, debates about Jews and dual loyalty, uh, attitudes towards Israel and its relevance or irrelevance to American life, um, anti-Semitic tropes involving Israel. Um, but that, of course, has become um, more and more present. And lastly, I just want to suggest uh, there's a certain paralysis. I, I, I am someone who comes to this trying to understand how we got here. Uh, and there was much, um, uh, all along, much concern how to respond. Today, we have an awful lot of talk about it, but there seems to be tremendous uncertainty and anxiety about what to do. And maybe we'll talk about some of the ways in which that manifests itself in questions about law, about civil rights, about what uh, we want to do to fight it. So um, before we move on, I wanted to ask one question for you to clarify, because you talked about cycles of anti-Semitism. Yes. And so if we're just in a cycle, then is it just inevitable? I mean, are there going to be moments where it grows and then people get so disgusted, society kind of then moves away from it and it goes down and then people forget about it? I mean, what, what drives those cycles? And um, is it, you know, the things that we're seeing today, are they just excuses for the growth because it would have happened anyway? Yeah, of course. So thank you. Um, 
let me start by saying this. From a historian's perspective, um, I don't believe in an eternal anti-Semitism. Right? I don't think that's the right way to think about it. It's of some force outside of society that just exists all along. Where well, there's a long history of Jew hatred, right? Um, but it takes different forms because it fits and emerges from, I would say, the society itself. The fears and fantasies of society about difference, about religion, about race, and other forms of difference. So that's what drives it. And I think it has to be understood in relation to how that manifests more generally in diverse societies like the United States. So I don't think it's some like protean force out there, which, you know, it always just comes up and comes in back. I think there's a baseline of it in society, just as there's a baseline of, of racial hatred in American society. And our goal is, of course, we wish to build a society where it would go away. Um, and we also have to think concretely about, um, as we look towards that future, how we really um, protect people, right? And, and, and that's, that's the challenge for us. The, the, the cycle, uh, the cyclical nature of it, um, it, it, is not, it is very clear it is connected to major ruptures in society. Um, Anti-Semitism, among other things, is a, as I mentioned, a fantasy, it's a fantasy about power. So in a moment in which um, um, so many Americans feel disenfranchised, disempowered, whether it's because of economic changes or a sense that politics doesn't you know, address their needs or they don't believe they're represented in the media or they don't believe that um, the country uh, looks the way they thought it should look and where they fit into it, those big social forces um, are the kinds of moments in which anti-Semitism flares up because it's, it's not just about conspiracy theories. Um, it's about a, a sort of an identity crisis of, of what a society is. And then Jews, because we're so um, distinctive and because we're confusing to people, right, about our identities, our complex identities, um, and our visibility versus our small size, um, that's what seems to drive it. And that's what seems to produce um, the anti-Semitic impulse, if you will. Yeah, so I guess, um, I guess I'm slightly uh, less optimistic in the sense that <laughs> it seems like a society or America needs, quote unquote, its Jews, right? A population, you know, across different divides to blame when they're disruption. Someone to talk about, as you said, there's some power out there that is leading to my situation. Someone must be to blame and it's an identifiable, and we are an identifiable group that can be put into that box as a group that can be blamed and then, um, you know, challenged and, and hated because of that. Mm -hmm. um, so, but we're going to come back to some of that yeah. in, in a second. Um, you, you wrote an article um, in The Atlantic about Charlottesville. Yes. And while we're going to be talking about anti-Semitism across different groups, I'd like to start off by, you know, if you can tell us a little bit about the article um, and why you decided to write it in the first place. Sure, sure. Um, you know, in many ways, um, I began by saying that, uh, like all of you, um, you know, I wear different hats, right? Um, and I come to this conversation as someone who teaches Jewish history at the University of Virginia. Um, and uh, I come to you as somebody who um, is a community member there. Uh, and, uh, you know, when Charlottesville happened in 2017, uh, there was um, a palpable sense of not only fear, but confusion about, well, where is justice in the aftermath of an event like this? And, um, you know, not just the question, how do we get here? How should, you know, what do we want our leaders to say? But where is actual justice? What can the law do? And then this trial uh, developed. And, um, you know, this trial is an interesting trial because it wasn't the government doing it, right? And it wasn't um, mainstream legacy organizations in the Jewish community doing this or other civil rights groups, it was a startup of a kind that we see across the political spectrum these days of different different Jewish groups popping up and saying, we want to try a different approach. And I was very curious about that, but I also thought here's a chance to make sense of, of what happened. Um, and I fundamentally also thought this is, um, this is a story of massive import, not simply to deliver justice, but to make sense of um, how we're going to explain to America what the threat of anti-Semitism is. So I, I just wanted to see with my own eyes um, who these anti-Semites were, and I wanted to see um, how they would be treated, and I wanted to uh, make sense of that, not as a you know professional journalist, but as a scholar who is seeing um, for the first time kind of 
you know, world historical events um, taking place in my backyard and, and, and impacting me. Uh, it's a, it was a tricky and difficult experience, but it uh, also felt just essential to try and do. So the story that most of us know about Charlottesville is going to unite the right rally, the chanting of the Jews will not replace us. And it's a story that most people are familiar with in terms of um, white supremacy and kind of that rationale. But you tell it's also a more complicated story because mm -hmm. it actually, the, the aftermath was not as simple to a certain extent in the story and the understanding. Can you tell a little bit more about that evolution? Sure, sure. Um, yeah, I mean, one of the things that's striking uh, about Charlottesville is not just, oh, here were these terrible, um, sometimes uh, absurd looking and yet very dangerous people coming from the far right, right? Uh, we know that was the story. But the story was also really about um, uh, the, the question of how Americans respond when they see racism and anti-Semitism happening together intertwined and how they respond when Jews say, okay, we need, we need your help, we need your partnership, we need your allyship in this. So um, one of the things that happened was uh, a debate broke out and a debate broke out in, in the Charlottesville community really about um, how much uh, airtime to give anti-Semitism versus the larger issues of racism um, and legacies of racism in a Southern town that, you know, that um, has had a, a long history of struggling to, um, to get uh, to a better place with race and, and, and uh, racial dynamics, race relations. Uh, and this also took on the cast of, of a kind of a debate um, that uh, is probably familiar to some people who are on this webinar with us, um, which is not just a debate about uh, uh, the challenge on the right and those who are conservative politically to say, what do we do with the extremists in our camp, but also on the left, right? Um, on grounds, as we call it, uh, on campus, there were debates basically about how to respond and where uh, Jewish student groups could be um, because of the question of Israel and because of the question of what kind of minority Jewish students represented uh, in a coalition of minorities. Um, we'll talk a little bit more, I think, later in the hour about kind of campus dynamics in general. But I simply want to say here that um, uh, even though a conversation started about um, far right people coming to Charlottesville to, you know, to perpetrate violence and terror, uh, it, it, it shifted very quickly into a question about Israel. Um, and so I often say to people, I do not think that um, it's helpful to, to kind of uh, say that anti-Semitism is as bad here as over here. I don't think all anti-Semitism is about Israel, um, but it often or almost always seems to end up there. That, that, part, of the, that part of the conversation seems to, to pop up, and it's very difficult to have a conversation about what we want to do to build alliances and to protect Jews and to respond to even far right anti-Semitism without suddenly talking about the progressive left and the debates over there. So that's, that, that's something there. Our challenge, I think, um, is to understand uh, how we're going to explain to both the, the, the right and the left, um, uh, as those of us who identify with one part of the spectrum or those of us who um, want to talk across the aisle, so to speak, how to explain really who Jews are and how our identities, are, you know, we have a religious tradition, but we're not just a religion like Protestant Christians, right? We have Jews of color, but also we are, when we face anti-Semitism, often racialized. And one of the challenges um, in Charlottesville is also to explain to other people who didn't really understand um, who Jews were in the story. They could clearly grasp that neo-Nazism and Nazi imagery is terrible, but they couldn't really understand why Jews faced a kind of sense of um, uh, targeting as non-whites if Jews like me and like you looked white to them, right? Uh, and that there was some genuine confusion and also there was some, um, some bias that crept into that discussion. So that was part of the story also um, in, in terms of what, what happened in Charlottesville. So um, before we move into some of the ways to tackle and there, yeah. um, I guess, you know, maybe you can spend a little bit kind of explaining the different characters. And you talked about it already a little bit, the different characters of characteristics of anti-Semitism across different demographic groups or political perspectives, because yeah. they're not all the same. Right. And so as we try to tackle them, understanding the rationale that kind of builds them up is really important. Sure. So I, I, I think one way to 
to to understand it is to um, to turn to this catchphrase, the most terrifying phrase I think for many of us that emerged from Charlottesville, which was "Jews will not Jews will not replace us," right? And we've heard about replacement theory. That's one kind of anti-Semitism, right? And and that um, uh, that is um, the idea, right? That the de racial demography of American society is changing, um, and Jews will not replace us. On his face, seems to suggest uh, that Jews have this sinister evil power that they control the media, they control our institutions and banks, they control our immigration policies, right? And therefore, the Jews are in the position of power to bring in other racial minorities uh, and religious minorities who are threatening to this segment of, of uh, extremist white America, right? Uh, and so that replacement is the idea that Jews are the ones with the power to replace us and they can, you know, they can mess with our society. They're all communists, they're all capitalists, that kind of stuff. But there's two other dimensions to this, which are important to, to talk about. And they're also kind of present in Charlottesville. Um, one is an idea of actually just um, the idea that Jews aren't white and that Jews themselves are a racial threat. This is the way the Nazis came to think about Jews, right? Uh, and there are segments in America who think that way as well today. Um, and there are segments of white supremacists who not only fear Jewish power, they fear Jewish bodies, right? Um, and and uh, this extends, of course, to other groups in American society, right? And I think that um, we can see some of this um, in Black anti-Semitism. We can see some of this in a sense um, of kind of um, a deep uh, fear and, and hatred towards Jews and Jewish bodies, whether it's ultra-Orthodox Jews in the streets of New York or others, uh, who seem to be somehow um, dangerous and threatening to them. Uh, what I think is common uh, to different kinds of anti-Semitism coming from minority communities or whether it's coming from uh, in the context of uh, Palestinian activism that turns and it crosses over into anti-Semitism, what I think is common is um, there's a religious element too. So this is the third thing I would say. Um, replacement is an important long-standing trope uh, inside the history of Christianity, right? And the attitude um, that basically Jews once existed as God's chosen people, and then uh, Christianity came along and it was, de it was designed and designated as Judaism's replacement, right? That's why Jesus came along, right? But those stubborn Jews wouldn't go away. And so they're, they become kind of charlatans who claim to be the pious elect, but religiously they are our enemies and they stand in the way and we need to replace them or they will replace us. I think that's a theme that you see uh, floating through a lot of Christian anti-Semitism classically and today. Some versions of what you see uh, in, look at Kanye West, right? I'll use his name. Um, you know, some of, some of his ideas are um, about racial dynamics, but at the heart of it, or Kyrie Irving, these, these specious theories about Jews, is an idea that Jews somehow stole the patrimony of ancient Africans and present-day African-Americans. That has a lot to do with religion. It has a lot to do with Christianity. And that's a thread you can find that, that runs throughout a lot of very otherwise disparate images. And then you can find it also um, in the Arab world. And you can find it also in terms of you know, fantasies um, and conspiracy theories about Zionism, that it is um, not just a nationalist movement that has power uh, over Palestinians and is engaged in a conflict, but that it is somehow also trying to replace the bodies of Arabs with Jews, right? Uh, and you can see it floating through these different things, um, even in secularized forms. So replacement is kind of a key trope that links these many different kinds of anti-Semitism. Um, and I think sometimes it's more helpful to, to use that lens than to talk so much about right versus left, um, because you can find the anti-Semitism is one of those ideologies where you're looking at the far right and all of a sudden an idea from the far right pops up on the far left right um and those that that traveling path of those tropes is something uh, distinctive about anti-semitism that we have to kind of keep our focus on so one more thing again before we get to uh what we can do about it the role of social media you talked about how kind of the i mean obviously in a lot of different ways where there's divisions in society elevating the voices of certain people um increasing awareness. Um, how do you see the role of social media, particularly in this moment in time, um, as there's a growth in anti-Semitism? Yeah, 
I mean, there's no doubt that it's playing a, uh, a massive role as an amplifier uh, effect, right? Um, there are a lot of, there's a, uh, there's in, in a certain sense, there's better research, and maybe we, we might talk about this, but um, there is better research about kind of social media anti-Semitism than actually other dimensions of anti-Semitism. Um, uh, I think that we are still in uh, the infant stages of a kind of renewed scholarship of anti-Semitism. In the past, we had um, a, a whole wave of it, and now um, it's sort of starting up again. Um, but uh, some of what we have immediately is um, not just public opinion, but research about um, social media. So it's there. Is this completely new? To go back to that opening question. Um, in some ways, this reminds me um, of earlier decades, 1920s and 30s, when suddenly there were mass newspapers and radio um, and there was this debate, right? you know, and there's this debate extended in the 30s and into the 40s where Jewish organizations said, we want to go to the FCC, Federal Communications Commission, and we want to ask them to suspend the licenses of stations that are broadcasting anti-Semitic um, propaganda and hate. Uh, so there are parallels in different moments in time. And just like that moment, we are debating what we want social media to be, how much should it be regulated, right? Um, but it's definitely playing a role. Uh, one of the challenges is really to understand, um, is it leading to more um, concrete actions? So far, it seems like it is. Um, it is certainly allowing groups to connect with one another and it's allowing people to self-radicalize. Um, so it's having a potent effect, but we still need more studies to understand exactly what that is and to understand basically what is, um, you know, an ignorant teenager mouthing off um, or someone, you know, um, pulling the Nazi card and then making some outrageous statement um, up to in a, in a heated debate. And when is that a sign um, of someone who is actually radicalizing, right? And, and going to create, a, a, you know, a social reality out of that, going to go out and do something terrible or going to go out and um, not even with that, before we get to violence, do something um, very destructive towards Jews. So now that we've defined to a certain extent a variety of different ways of thinking yeah. about an anti-Semitism, um, the growth, uh, the role of social media, um, I want to start kind of, um, and we will get to universities and that in the in the moment on its own, but um, as we think about strategies as a Jewish community, as a country to address anti-Semitism, yeah. Um, what do you see um, as some of the key strategies, role of education or legislation, leadership? What, what are the things that we can use um, that can help kind of more quickly turn that tide um, and reduce anti-Semitism? Sure. So you, you mentioned education. Um, you know, I think uh, since, uh, since World War II and really since the 1970s, that's been our first go-to, right? Um, some of you may recall the Skokie March um, and the neo-Nazis in the 70s. Uh, there were debates then about, well, what, what can we do? And one of the decisions was we can educate, right? And we can use the, the, the Holocaust uh, as a historical event to, to educate. Um, we're um, uh, coming up on uh, International Holocaust Remembrance. You know, there are, there are key moments. Uh, I think that can be effective. I will tell you that um, to be most effective, we have to do two things when it comes to education. And one of them is we have to be willing to be clear about how anti-Semitism relates to other hatreds. Consistently, when we see in public school curricula or we see, you know, in community events uh, or when um, celebrities say something uh, wrong and inappropriate and we want to kind of um, correct the record, we have to be able to explain how anti-Semitism is related to religious hatred of other kinds and um, color-based racism, right? And I think sometimes we put a premium on making sure people understand how distinctive anti-Semitism is as a phenomenon. But if we can't relate it, it's going to be impossible for you know your kid's school teacher to kind of build a good curriculum and to run a good lesson. Uh, and I can tell you in the university context, People, even who are sympathetic, want to understand, well, how does this relate to other stories that get a lot of um, focus, you know, in our curricula when we talk about the history of the United States. It can't just be, we have it too here. It has to be sort of, okay, so was anti-Semitism related to anti-Catholic sentiment or was it really about, you know, 
earlier versions of white supremacy and hatred against blacks and Jews, that kind of thing. Um, so I think we have to do that. And the second thing is with education, we do have to be willing to be as specific as possible about what our goals are. I'm someone who thinks the Holocaust is, is important, but often we kind of take it as self-evident that if we teach about it, we'll teach lessons. And I think the harder questions, which have come up in you know, this documentary and PBS and, and elsewhere, is more about, well, what um, in the face of this, what kind of action and policies do we want? So education has to be linked to, as you mentioned, legislation it has to be linked to the question of what policy should look like. Um, here, I am struck, and this is one of the reasons I went to cover the Charlottesville trial to attend it and write about it. I'm struck by the fact that we talk an awful lot about anti-Semitism, but we're very uncertain about what we want the law to do on that front. Um, it's notable that that trial was, again, not Jewish organizations doing it. Some of them supported it. They gave funds to help that trial go forward. But it was a startup of people who said, basically, activist lawyers. Uh, and there are other organizations which have jumped into this space and said, you know, we want to start documenting anti-Semitism, filing lawsuits. I think there has to be a better dialogue between that work and the legacy institutions in the Jewish community who can say, OK, what is our communal policy going to be? Uh, how are we going to address that? Um, there's a lot happening with law, um, but it feels like we're going to kind of throw different things against the wall and see what sticks. And I think a more uh, intentional approach, which says, OK, what are our goals with this and how will this relate to the, all the other civil rights claims that are out there these days will help us to do a better design and to do better work in making the law really address anti-Semitism. So um, one of the things that I've uh, also heard a lot is uh, trying to get, you know, so the, the uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion training that's done to make sure that anti-Semitism is part of that as well. Um, is that something that fits with your kind of logic of education or would you see it as distinct? So um, it's a piece of it, yes. And this is what I would say about that. Uh, there is, I think, um, a lot of apprehension um, in the Jewish community about what that approach is. Uh, there's also a lot of skepticism um, and even hostility. And I, I will tell you, um, I see that not only um, in the conservative seg segment of Jewish America, um, which has very, um, you know, pronounced views about that, what DEI and it's, you know, um, as a pernicious thing. Um, but you see it also in parts of the progressive Jewish space, too, where it said, well, this is superficial, right? This isn't getting at the core issues in American society, right? This is really getting people to be sensitized, but it's not even addressing um, the core questions about race and economics and, and power and things like that. So um, I think it's it's it needs to be engaged with. And I would say um, it should not be demonized. Um, it's an attempt to kind of come up with a, a better version of how we teach our students to think about who they are and to walk them into these hard questions. And for, for corporate America too, right? It's a tool to try and do that. It's not a cure-all. I don't. I also don't think it is um, going to destroy, you know, um, democracy. Um, but if if Jews are um, concerned about it, then that this is the time to get involved and say, okay, what what do we want America to understand, right, about who Jews are and what anti-Semitism is? And once again, we'll have to be willing to explain um, how it is related to other forms of hatred. Um, many of us have, um, you know, family members who uh, are also, um, they may be Jews of color, right, and belong to other communities, Asian America, Black America, you know, there's a lot of challenges out there about violence and hatred, we know. So uh, to be successful, we have to be willing to make our proposals also um, connect in some way to those issues. So let's get to universities. Yeah. Um, obviously a place where you spend a lot of time and you're very familiar with it. Um, a lot of concern about uh, the rise of you know, anti-Semitism, anti-Israel activity on campuses. Um, I guess I'd like to understand a little bit about your perception of that, yeah. um, but also what do you think um, can be done? Your role as an academic, as a professor, as an academic leader, um, are there things that can be done within the context of the university that can also change some of that dynamic. Sure. 
So I'm going to I'm going to give you my good news version of it. Good news, bad news. The good news is um, I do not think that the anti-Semitism um, danger uh, on the American college campus is nearly um, of the scale um, or of the severity as it is often depicted in the media. Uh, I talk to um, students, uh, work with students. I talk to colleagues at other uh, colleges and universities. Um, it is not nearly as bad as it is often portrayed to be. Um, it is something where the vast majority of American college students are actually not even paying attention and thinking about Jews, Jewish issues, thinking about Israel. It is, it is just not there. Um, now, with that said, there are certainly real challenges um, and there are instances of anti-Semitism and they appear. Uh, they tend to appear, um, we see swastikas and whatnot, but of course they tend to appear mostly in connection with the Israeli-Palestinian conflict on campus. The challenge is this, um, for many students who do not get involved with that and are not involved in Israel advocacy or involved in trying to do dialogue about the conflict, uh, they never experience it. Um, and oftentimes I poll students in my class to just kind of try and get them anonymously to talk about these issues. And they often say um, they didn't even hear about the controversy happening. Uh, we have faced controversies at UVA in the past year and a half. Um, and one of the striking things was it was a serious challenge for a portion of the Jewish student community. Um, and it was a serious controversy. But when I asked faculty, many of them didn't even hear about it till weeks afterwards. Uh, and they consume much of the same media that, that you and I do. Uh, when I asked students who were not involved in Hillel, or not involved in um, student government, they hadn't heard about it. So uh, what that tells us is it's patchy, right? And any strategy for confronting it is going to have to recognize that we're going to have to educate a lot of people um, about what it is, but we also don't want to create more of a problem than, than actually exists. And I think we have to be very smart about how we do that. Um, I don't think we should instill fear in our high school students that they're going into a, a, you know, a climate in which they are constantly going to be attacked. Uh, but we have to think um, smartly about how to do it. Now, um, one of the biggest challenges um, is uh, that um, oftentimes the campus climate uh, gets exacerbated when outside groups come in. They may come from the left, they may come from the right. Some of them really want to do the right thing and support students, but that often complicates the situation in which Hillel or even Chabad leaders are trying to learn how to respond and suddenly other groups are coming and saying to students, hey, we're going to help you, we want to come empower you. Um, but that is something which makes our life as people trying to guide Jewish communities on campus through this um, even harder. Uh, because immediately when that happens, it becomes framed as the autonomy of the university versus outside forces. And the challenge, I think, for Jewish um, communal stakeholders is to figure out how can we support students? How can we plug into universities in ways in which we'll get the president to pay attention to the university? We'll get the, the, the diversity people to pay attention. We'll support the faculty. We'll support the rabbis. We'll support the student leaders um, in a way in which we're sort of part of the solution rather than seen as interlopers who are going to breed kind of division inside the, the community there. I guess I guess a, a couple things just to um yeah kind of just to push back a little bit. But Please. I mean two things. One of personal experiences with local academic institutions, clearly the university um leadership wants it to go away. They don't want yeah. it to become public. Yeah. They um, don't want to, in many cases, even engage if it would just disappear. That's right. right. Yeah. So the, there's the interest of the internal leadership um, in many ways to kind of minimize and, and just have it kind of dissipate. Yeah. And the other part is, um, and I was just thinking about you talking about, so even if the anti-Semitism affects directly one half of 1%, one tenth of 1% of the population, isn't that enough to actually have a significant impact on a large segment? We think about the broader society. Most of us today, or a lot of people have not, have not had direct anti-Semitism against us, but we've seen it elsewhere, we've heard about it, and it still affects our lives. Yeah. And so I guess the question there is, it doesn't have to be you know, pervasive and you know, kind of daily or even 
to, to have an impact on people's identity, engagement, and sense of place. And so yeah. I guess I just want to kind of push on that a little bit. Sure. So let, let me, I, I'm glad you are, because we got to get this right if we're going to talk about it, right? Um, so let me start by saying that, you know, any anti-Semitism is too much, right? We shouldn't, uh, you know, um, I can tell you that it's cyclical and things like that, but, um, you know, if one student is impacted um, and faces bias, faces hate, faces endangerment, um, that's not acceptable, right? So the challenge is when I mention the scale, it's, be, it's, it's because to make sense of how to approach it, to get those administrators to care, we have to view it in the context. So that's what I mean by it. So if we go in and we say that this is a, um, an epidemic, we risk losing credibility, we risk being seen as sort of single issue, you know, um, stakeholders. And the most effective instances I've seen at different universities are where there is a pre existing dialogue about how to improve climate for Jewish students, how to engage with the Jewish community. And there's a relationship there that pre exists crisis. When that happens, I think a lot of good can come. And then there's a deeper appreciation for this. So this is sort of part of the fabric of the university and we have to address it. Um, I, I, I'll just, I'll give you one example um, that strikes me as something I observed. I was walking down the lawn, the historic quad of the University of Virginia um, a couple months ago. And I, I you know, you, pa you pass student dorm rooms and you look, is there a free Palestine sign, right? Is there something, uh, something about Israel? Uh, and this time I didn't see it, but I saw free Kashmir, free Indian occupied Kashmir from a Pakistani student that put this up with a big flag. And then the next two rooms down, I saw free Kurdistan, right? And different times I've seen free Tibet. Uh, the point is there are a number of different issues. How many kids on campus care about Kurdistan or know that there's a Kurdistan issue or a Kashmir issue? Not that many, but for some Hindu American students, and there are more and more of them, South Asians, uh, that, that's a real issue. And, and Muslim Americans, that's a real issue. My point is not that our issue is, is less important, it's that if we're gonna explain it to university leadership, we're gonna to have to find a way to make it uh, fit in the, the broader landscape of what they're thinking about. Um, and I do think we're gonna to have to say, make the argument that it's not just, we're gonna yank our support for you, um, or we're gonna insist that you do this. It has to be um, that we're a resource, right? We're, the Jewish philanthropy is a resource. Um, Jewish parental engagement, Jewish alumni, Jewish parents, this is a resource for the university. Um, and so we can help you get it right. Uh, we live in a, in a crisis driven society, but universities are also unique in that they're designed to be slow, right? They're supposed to be the place we go. Why would we send someone for four years to, you know, to study, right? That's, that's, that's a huge chunk of time. Uh, but we do it because we believe in the virtue of slow and 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 we believe that these universities um, are going to slowly move to get these issues right but and and i think taking that view can help us i dare i say to be patient with universities as well as to be vigilant that they do the right thing so um i'm not sure if this next question is asking you to put on a different hat but yeah. it'll probably be a combination of multiple hats um so we've had uh, some questions about uh, more um, roles of parent. And so, um, so for you, obviously someone who studies this, understands a lot about it and someone who has, has children, um, some of the parents, some of the people wanna know how should they talk to their children? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, what should they, you know, if there's an anti-Semitic incident in their school or their county, and we've seen it in our region, um, what should they say? How do they even engage in this when, you know, for a long time, and I can tell you for my kids who are older, they're now kind of the 18 to 27, they grew up with very little, if any, kind of, you know, anti-Semitism as they were younger in their environment, and now it's completely shifted. So how would you talk, you yeah. know, as a parent to a kid, or what advice would you have for parents? Yeah, well, I should put my kids on, right, and let them, let them... <laughs> Tell us, because they, they know better than the parents. But um, look, I, I would say this. Um, there is a danger with anti-Semitism, um, a danger to Jewish lives, right, and Jewish flourishing. There's also a danger uh, of what it does to the Jewish psyche. So, um, you know, I'm a historian who thinks about law, who thinks about politics, um, but I also believe that it's important to cultivate just a basic self-understanding, uh, pride, 
and to and to make sure the first thing with children is they're not internalizing it right it's very easy for children to internalize these messages and then to internalize it to the point where they say well who cares if they say that you know um, um, even to be cynical about it. I don't think that's uh, something that uh, we should let stand. And I think we have to support kids, but also say, this is serious. Um, this isn't Nazi Germany. And I think we can use history here to make it easier. The Nazis are not here, right? This isn't Israel with a different kind of violence and threats, right? Um, there is violence here. There are people with guns, we know about that, but it's also important to say that this society is not one which is organized against us, right? And this is a society of flourishing, and I'm going to write a book and tell you about the history of anti-Semitism, but I'll also say this is an open society, and this is a society that values Jews um, in, in powerful ways. So I think that's a message to give. A second one is to say that, you know, I often say to college students, um, the, the great thing about studying Jewish history is that we're still here, right? It's a story about survival, right? And so there are great, great, um, terrible things in our past, but we're still here um, and we um, are not going anywhere, right? And that's important to understand that this is not like the end point of, of Jewish history, um, even if there are scary things happening out there in the world. And even if we ourselves feel deep apprehension that we don't know what's going to come next. Um, there's a famous um, uh, essay uh, by a scholar named Shimon Rabidovich, uh, in which he talks about uh, the ever dying people. And he says, in every generation, Jews have been afraid that they're dying out, that you know people are abandoning their religion or that the Greeks are going to destroy us or the Romans, or the Crusaders, in every generation. Um, and they've worried about that, but in worrying, they've proved that they keep going, right? And so um, sometimes we can take comfort in Jewish history to say, essentially, we will get through this. Thank you. Um, so we are starting to near the end, or roughly yeah. another, you know, five or seven minutes. And I just want to touch on a couple of the questions that we have. Um, to what degree do you feel that divisions within the Jewish community um, are affecting this? I mean, is it inhibiting our ability to fight anti-Semitism. I've heard um, arguments made that basically if, if all Jews do is criticize anti-Semitism of the other political parties, so if you're on the left and you criticize it on the right or from the right to the left, you're actually not fighting anti-Semitism, you're just engaging in regular American politics. Um, to what degree do we need to address divisions within our community even as we try to fight um, anti-Semitism from the outside. Sure. Yeah, I, I think um, it's a real challenge. Um, I do think those divisions have to be noted. Um, I think if we don't, we end up with only the most superficial consensus, right, um, which doesn't really move the needle and doesn't really satisfy people. Um, what I would say is we need to try and be focused, however, on what, in asking what, what we want. So uh, we, we talked earlier about a trial. We don't have to go back to it, but simply to say, what kind of protection do we want? There's a lot of things happening now, you know, um, involving BDS, involving legislation, um, definitions of anti-Semitism. And we often focus on, well, which group is putting that forward or, you know, what's that? I think it's more important to ask, um, how do we want to be treated in American law? What do we want and what kind of protection do we want? And you know, what are the implications of that? I think American Jews can do better if we um, talk about those things. Um, I'll give you an example. We did a conference a couple of years ago about um, anti-discrimination law, basically, um, which is central to a lot of the ways in which people can bring um, actions to stop anti-Semitism, college campuses, employment, elsewhere. And we had people from across the political spectrum there. And, the, and the, the goal of the conference, part of it was to simply ask um, if we ask for this protection, are we asking for it as a religious group or as an ethnic group or as a national group? And what does that mean, right? Um, there's a lot of confusion about that because there's always confusion about Jewish identity. Um, and, but I think if we ask that question, how do we want to be seen by the law? Who are we um, as a community? Then it'll force us to be I think more open to quote unquote the other side because we can ask um, what kind of identity we share together. So I think that is one way to approach it. I also would say one other thing, um, and this is true for the left and the right. 
Uh, I have my own politics, my own opinions, but I would say for, for all the proposals that we put on the table, we have to ask how will this affect other groups? We've already begun to see that um, Palestinian Americans and their advocates are saying, oh, if they're going to, if, if Jewish groups are going to push for this type of legislation, maybe we'll push for it for ourselves, right? Maybe we'll file lawsuits. Uh, and so that's a question. That's a strategy question. And I think it, it will cut across the Jewish world in surprising ways, not just right, left, about how people understand um, if we ask for something in law, if we look for this kind of policy solution, what will it mean for other communities with whom we might be in conflict or, or actually not? Okay, so um, uh, one more before we uh, start getting to the end. Um, yeah. You've identified a couple of areas in terms of things that people can do to fight Jew hatred, um, whether it's issues in law that need to be thought about. Um, another thing, can you kind of just bring some of that together? You know, kind of if you had advice for someone who wanted to, you know, not only kind of understand the nature of anti Semitism in America today, but do something about it. Yeah. Um, can you give some, you know, pretty specific examples of what that might look like? Sure. Um, I'll start by saying um, political engagement, right? Um, and I don't mean necessarily on the national level, even, I mean on the local level. So many issues we now see pop up. Suddenly there's a resolution, you know, an anti Israel resolution or some other thing popping up um, in Montgomery County, in this region, elsewhere. Um, and our clergy and our communal leaders uh, and activists get involved. But I think it's really important for civic engagement, for people to get to know the representatives and have conversations with them, even the local people, not when it's a crisis, right? Not when it's a sense of, what are you going to vote about this? Or did you see what they just, what your colleague just did? Um, that's really important. It's, it can't be kind of a spectator sport and a checkbook sport, right? Uh, or an internet sport. It, that, that's really important. Um, alliances are really important. And they're very hard these days, I think, for the Jewish community. But the successes that we have scored over the decades in fighting anti-Semitism, we've scored many wins, um, have almost always come through partnerships with other communities, whether it's to get votes or to get bodies um, or just to get um, support, right? And so that's something that's also worth doing. I think that talking to our non-Jewish neighbors and colleagues about it is really important. And the overall message I'm suggesting is um, there's a lot of work we can do to educate ourselves and also to educate society about this. I don't think we have to only rely on the experts to do it or the talking heads. And um, I'll put in one more plug, which is I do think um, there is great scholarship out there. Um, and I would say this even if I wasn't a scholar, um, you know, there's great scholarship out there for historians who help us understand this. And what is this compared to France today? What is this compared to France 100 years ago? Um, and I would say that's the stuff that we all should be reading. And in my case, I would say rereading because that can give us a perspective. That is a weapon in the fight against anti-Semitism. So last question that we always have is, um, what are you most worried about today? And then what gives you hope? Yeah. So um, I, I am most worried about Israel. Um, I'm most worried about not just the democratic crisis, which I think is really happening there now, um, but I'm worried that, um, you know, more and more the Israeli-Palestinian conflict will define so much of what we talk about and think about and face in terms of anti-Semitism that we will no longer be uh, authors of our own story, that we will only be sort of uh, constantly arguing about or having to respond to events over there. And I think the challenge is really to have an American Jewish identity and vision of what we want to do. Um, and even though that conflict is enmeshed in our world, um, to define it for, uh, for ourselves. I'm worried that we you know, will let that overtake us in a certain sense, as, as well as our communal cohesion. Um, I'm optimistic and, and what gives me hope is I work on a college campus. So students, you know, students today um, are open minded. They're cynical, but in a good way, you know, um, they many of them come and they say, I don't want to hear the take on it. I want to understand the complexity of it. I'm not interested in the media. I, I want to kind of get into something deeper. Um, I've seen the conversations between people who are on completely opposite sides of the Israeli Palestinian conflict. Um, work in the classroom. They clash outside in the classroom. They can actually talk about the history. 
Um, I'm optimistic about those students um, who, you know, want to be practical. And I do think they um, are our future um, in terms of thinking about these issues. And, you know, there's hope there. Jim, thank you so, so much for joining us this evening. Thank you for your uh, study of this issue and your articulation so clearly of the challenges that we're facing uh, and really kind of bringing some of this very complicated idea um, and grounding it, um, both history and in current reality. I think that that's the key step. And then as we you know, you know, think about what do we do now, how do we tackle it? So I just wanted to thank you for everything that you're doing um, at UVA and in our community and as a member of our community. Um, I also wanna thank the Shalom Hartman Institute for your partnership as we tackle very complicated issues and seek to not only understand them, but figure out ways that we can address them as a Jewish community. And finally, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today. Thank you everyone for being part of this conversation um, and for the questions. I apologize to those people if you posed a question that we were not able to get to, um, but I thank everyone for being part of this and for your own leadership within this community. Um, as we go forward, this is gonna be an issue obviously that we're gonna continue addressing and thinking about. Um, it's something that we have to tackle as a Jewish community. And we look forward to not only further conversations, but some very specific actions that we can take collectively. Um, in the chat, there's some additional resources, um, both for reading and understanding about both the Jewish Federation and Shalom Hartman. Thank you everyone and have a wonderful evening.